Hi everybody, I've been asked to prepare this pre-recorded presentation in advance of the Shad Symposium on the 24th to 25th of May to give you a whistle-stop tour of why and how we built the River Seven fish passes and specifically sharing examples of the challenges we've had to face whilst building the deep vertical slot fish pass at Diglas Weir on the River Seven. I'm more than happy to answer any questions you may have and you can send these through to the event organisers who will be able to pass them on. But firstly, I thought I should explain who I am, my background, and how I was lucky enough to find myself working on this project. I'm a chartered civil engineer with over 25 years experience working on construction projects. I spent the majority of my career working for the Canal and River Trust in engineering roles, specialising building and repairing assets there next to rivers and waterways. I joined the Unlocking the Seven delivery team in 2018 as the Trust Project Engineer. I undertook a variety of roles, but my primary task has been to take the outline proposals for the fish passes, manage the detailed design process and ensure we have a buildable design, help resolve any issues found during construction and perhaps most importantly, ensure that what we build meets the requirements to allow fish to use these structures. One important thing to note is that I'm not a fish pass designer. I worked very closely with a team of experts who provided the information and guidance needed to ensure the structures work from a fisheries perspective. So why do you need fish passes on the River Severn? During the Industrial Revolution, the River Severn became very important for carrying goods and material. In 1824, it was noted that the river is navigable the whole way, but navigation is very much impeded by the lowness of water in summer and by floods in winter. In the 1840s, navigation on the River Severn was improved by the construction of a series of weirs and locks. This photo shows a typical weir on the River Severn. These are large structures designed to increase the depth of water upstream. This cross section shows that they were constructed from large rocks encased in an early form of concrete. The water level upstream is roughly two metres higher than the water level below. Almost immediately after the construction of the weirs, the impact on migratory fish was noted, as you can see from this quote from a fisheries report in 1862. The finest river in England is nearly ruined by building walls across it, sufficient to stop everything except a large and powerful animal. Works were undertaken to improve fish passage relatively soon after construction of the weirs by the provision of notches in the weir crest to give a flow of water for the fish to swim up. This worked for more powerful fish such as salmon, but didn't help weaker species such as the Twait Shad. Weirs and locks were constructed along the river in six locations, Gloucester, Upper Lode, Diglas, Beverley, Holt and Lincoln, as you can see on this map. The bottom two weirs are tidal, so fish can simply swim over them um, at high tides. Our project is therefore focused on fish pass provision at the weirs around Worcester. So what's the target fish? By joining this event, you'll know that our target fish is the Twait Shad. The populations of this fish were devastated by the construction of the weirs as they're not particularly strong swimmers and were unable to make it over the weir at Diglas in central Worcester. From a design perspective, by targeting the weakest swimming fish on the River Severn, it should mean that all other fish will be able to use the new fish passes. Other pre-recorded presentations have looked at how the fish pass designs were chosen on the River Severn and River Team, so I'm not going to go into the detail of this process. But in summary, for the weirs on the River Severn, two different types of fish pass were chosen. Deep vertical slots at Diglas, Holt and Lincoln, and a naturalised bypass channel at Beverley. The deep vertical slot fish passes have been used at the sites where less space was available. Both types of fish pass have small steps designed so that fish can use their burst speed to get up to the next level, catch their breath before going again. How the structures achieve this is very different and I'll explain this in more detail across the two separate presentations. This talk is going to primarily focus on Diglas Fish Pass, which is the first weir requiring improved fish passage on the River Severn. And I'm able to explain the key design features along with the specific challenges of building them on the following slides. 
The design for Diglis is very similar to the other deep vertical slot fish passes constructed on the River Severn at Holt and Lincoln Weirs. The key features of the deep vertical slot design used at Diglis um, are the gradient is greater by approximately 50% than a naturalised um, bypass channel as less space was available. The overall fish pass length is approximately 80 metres compared to 120 metres for the naturalised bypass channel at Beverley. Very long and heavy piles form both the temporary restraint and permanent outer walls of the structure. This is why they're called deep vertical slots as the bottom is up to seven and a half metres below the adjacent riverside path level. This is a photo showing the piles being installed uh, from above um, and a photo on the left is the piles being completed or the cough dam being completed um, at the downstream end of the fish pass um, and the photo to the right is the completed piles cut down to finished level. The ground inside the piles was then removed. This was a massive undertaking with over 4,000 cubic metres of material excavated. The fish pass itself was constructed inside the piles using reinforced concrete. So the photo on the left is the steel reinforcement cage um, prior to um, the placement of the concrete base. The steps for the fish pass to climb up are formed by the construction of a series of pools with what we call nibs and C-sections at the upstream end. Together, these create a small, uh, small slot that the water passes through that the fish are able to burst through before resting in the pool above. And the photo on the right, you can see where we're constructing the C-sections, which are the bits in the middle, and the nibs, which are the, the, the bits in between, um, and where the orange fence is here is where the, the finished slot is for the fish to swim through. This may be easy to understand by looking at the plan drawings for these pools. Water passes between the nibs and C sections as I've sketched in blue before being held up by the nibs and C sections below and the process repeats. This flow of water should create eddies and calm spots where the fish can wait as shown by the red dots before darting through the gap into the pool above. The water speed is at its fastest as it passes through between the nib and C section, but it's been designed so that it doesn't exceed two and a half meters per second, which is, the sl which is slower than the fish's burst speed. In this sketch, I've tried to show in blue how the water will step down as it passes through the fish pass. I think it's easy to un understand how the pools will form a series of small steps for the fish to swim up. On the outside of the fish pass are what are called the attraction flow channels. These are needed to allow a sufficient volume of water to pass through the fish pass to allow the migrating fish to find the downstream entrance to the fish pass. These have been designed to be adjustable so that just the right, right amount of water passes through the fish pass to attract the fish, but not so much that it makes them difficult to use the fish pass. You can just about make out on the left hand uh, side of this photo um, the penstock that controls the flow of water through the attraction flow channel on, on the left um, and there's a similar uh, penstock on the right hand side um, attraction flow uh, channel um, and this is a view from the downstream end um, where you can clearly see the uh, the channels on both sides of the fish pass. Um, at, the, at the bottom of the fish pass the water flows come together um, through large screens designed to smooth, smooth the flow of water and stop fish swimming up these channels. So on this photo you can see these um, you can see these screens where the water meets um, just at the bottom of the shot here. At Diglas Fish Pass there's an underwater viewing gallery and window that will be used for scientific monitoring of the fish using the pass and as an education facility for schools and members of the public. The building on top of the viewing gallery has been designed to go underwater when the river floods and has a waterproof door to stop water entering the building. We designed a very large underwater window that can be submerged eight metres underwater. We had to go to a specialist that supplies windows to the Sea Life Centre. The window is, is at the largest size that can be manufactured in the UK in one piece. 
The window is constructed from four laminations of glass, each 20 millimetres thick and having a total weight of one tonne. The front lamination is designed to be replaceable should it be needed in the future. Key decisions that we made pre-construction. We knew it would flood during the course of the works. The historic river level data showed that this was likely to happen three to four times a year and we had to decide what level of flood protection should be provided. A higher level would equal more cost but reduces the frequency of inundation into the works area. We decided to protect the works up to a level of 12 metres AOD which is shown by this brown line on the graph. The maximum recorded flood level is around 15.3 metres um, which again you can see probably by the purple line, the blue and purple lines on the graph to the left hand side um, and at times the works were, were submerged by over two metres. We were flooded out numerous times during the construction works however at Diglas the site tends to flood for five to ten days before dropping and allowing works to progress. I thought I would share with you some key construction issues that were overcome during the works. We used AZ type piles in the design and planned to install them by pre-augering the clutch positions and placing them initially with a Movax type drive vibro hammer and finishing them with a, with, with a drop hammer. So the, the profile for an AZ pile um, you can see in the middle here, you can see it, it basically looks like a Z. Um, the Movax installation kit is shown on the right hand side and the drop hammer is on the end of a big crane uh, shown on the left hand side. We had difficulty installing the piles due to high bedrock levels and harder than expected ground conditions. The AZ piles were supplied as crimp pairs which meant the installation width was between 1.4 and 1.6 metres. This meant that the piling hammer didn't fit fully on top of the piles and the impact energy was distributed over a large area. As you can see the, the photo on the left um, shows the piling hammer and you can see it's just not quite extending over the full width of the piles. As a result we started to bend the top of the, um, top of the piles um, and we needed to weld on strengthening plates um, and the middle photo you can see these plates that have been welded onto the top of the top of the pile to allow us to put some more energy through the pile to get them installed. In addition we found that the crimping process elongated each pile by around 15 to 25 millimetres per pair. This meant that the overall length of the fish pass um, became one and a half metres too long. To resolve this problem at Lincoln um, fish pass we designed the piles using um, a U profile section, which is what's shown on the right hand side. These come as singles um, with a 600 millimeter width. We also increased the section size to improve drivability. This meant that a wider choice of installation equipment was available. More impact force could be generated in the pile and the width between piles remained constant. We still had an issue with the ground investigation ind indicating less competent bedrock. On future schemes, we will ask for both upper and lower values to inform both the pile design and installation methodology, which we learnt needs to be undertaken hand in hand. Archaeology. The excavation works were supervised by a team of archaeologists. We found some interesting features as we excavated through the line of the original weir construction. Um, and on the left hand photo, you can just about see the original timber cutoff piles. Um, the, um, these are in line with the weir itself. Um, and were installed to stop water leaking around the outside of that structure. Piling through the existing weir. The existing weir is constructed from an early form of concrete and stone pitchings and is very hard. We had to construct a platform out across the weir to allow the construction plan access to drill through and break up the weir. Once complete, we then needed to repair the section of the weir that had been damaged during the pile installation. COVID-19 also presented some challenges. Um, if you've ever walked past Diglas Fish Pass, um, you'll notice that it's adjacent to a riverside path um, and the, the site access had to cross this public footpath to get to the works area. At the start of lockdown one, we had to shut down the site temporarily whilst the situation became clear and we could work out how best to manage this and other works on site to ensure they remained COVID secure. So how do we do? 
We completed the fish pass and made it fully operational just in time for the spring spawning season for the Twait Shad um, in April 2021. The fish pass was fitted with monitoring equipment to see how well it performs over the coming months and years. Um, at that time, we produced a, a short film showing the completed fish pass, and I'll share that with you now. The Lock in the Seven is being delivered by Canal and River Trust, Seven Rivers Trust, Environment Agency, and Natural England, with vital support from National Lottery Heritage Fund and the EU Life Programme. I am Jason Leach, Programme Director for Canal and River Trust on Unlock in the Seven. This is a once in a lifetime opportunity to restore connectivity for migratory fish on the UK's longest river. Fish migration was severed about 180 years ago with the construction of the locks and weirs to facilitate navigation. The Twait Shad population crashed almost overnight and has led it to be one of the UK's rarest fish today. We're building four big fish passes. Diglett, the biggest, at a massive 100 metres long, 8 metres wide and 5 metres deep. It's the biggest deep vertical slot in England and Wales and has a unique underwater river viewing gallery. The fish pass is formed of a series of ascending pools that take the fish in manageable steps from one level at the bottom of the weir to the higher level above it. This year, for the first time in nearly 180 years, Twait Shad will be able to pass and get upriver to their historic spawning habitats where they'll have a better chance of reproducing. This fish pass will also benefit other endangered fish species, including salmon, eel and lamprey. The window in the fish pass will be used for scientific monitoring with specialist film equipment, but we're also really looking forward to welcoming visitors and we're going to put in audio-visual installation. Visitors will be able to book a visit to come down into the fish pass and see through the window into the flowing river and hopefully see some of its wild fish. From a financial perspective, despite the issues that we found during construction, we managed to deliver the scheme within 2% of its original estimate of 4.2 million. This has been achieved through a truly collaborative team effort to identify issues and solve them in the most efficient way possible for all parties. For me, this has been an amazing project to work on and I feel very lucky to have been involved in the design and construction of this fish pass, which should remain working for at least the next 120 years. Thank you very much for listening. As I said at the start, this is a whistle stop tour of building the deep vertical slot fish pass at Diglas Weir. Um, please also review my presentation covering the challenges of building the naturalised bypass channel fish pass at Beverly Weir. I've covered quite a lot of areas. I'm happy to try and answer any questions that, that you may have. Um, as noted at the start, if you, if you could send those through to the event orga organisers, and I'll, I'll happily get back to you um, with any answers. Thanks again.